Antibiotic resistance. So I've been talking a lot about antibiotics and how they work. Well, now I want to talk about antibiotic resistance and how that actually occurs. First of all, this is one way we can measure antibiotic resistance. So on the left is a Petri dish where bacteria have been spread all over the plate. On each of these little white dots, there are little filter papers that contain a different antibiotic. So in the clear zones around those filters, the bacteria haven't grown or they died. And the cloudy parts are where there's still bacteria. So this strain is sensitive to all these antibiotics. On this side, though, is the same species, but it's a multi-drug resistant version. Here you can see that at least two of these antibiotics, there's no sensitivity at all. And for two others, there's less than there was on the original. So this is one way in practice we can measure antibiotic resistance. So as far as mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, uh, it can be complex. But on the left side here, is shown all the targets for antibiotic resistance or antibiotics that I've already described. On the right side are the antibiotic resistance mechanisms. And there are four of them, and I'm going to talk about each of them. We have efflux, immunity and bypass, target modification, and inactivating enzymes. I'm going to start with inactivating enzymes. So last week, I told you about penicillin. And if you remember, this is the chemical structure of penicillin. What I think what I, you should remember is this little square I pointed out. And that is the beta-lactam ring. This is the same in penicillin, which is the first generation of penicillins, or beta-lactams. And then this is second and third generation, so these are modifications of the basic structure, structure, which are called cephalosporins. So the main way in which resistance to these drugs occurs is by an enzyme that inactivates it. And it does so in a fairly straightforward way. Here is the penicillin. This enzyme called beta-lactamase simply cuts that ring. It cuts between the two bonds of that ring here and opens it up. Afterward, there's a rearrangement of the structure, but that doesn't matter. At this point, it's inactive. So the way resistance occurs is simply by producing an enzyme, chops up the antibiotic, all gone. All right. So as I indicated, there are different types of penicillins or beta-lactams. The first generation was penicillin, and then you had cephalosporins. ESBL strains stand for extended spectrum beta-lactamases. These are bacteria that produce an enzyme that target both penicillins but also the second and third generation of beta-lactams, cephalosporins. ESBL is one of the biggest problems now and a rapidly growing problem. Here, for example, is a map of Europe showing the resistance of Klebsiella pneumoniae, one particular bacteria, to the third generation cephalosporins. This is data from 2017. You can go to this website called ECDC if you want to play with maps and get depressed. Uh, you can't see the numbers here, but I'll tell you what they are. Red is bad. Green is good. So in uh, Greece and Southern Europe, you have numbers like, I can't even see those, 50 to 75% resistant of this bacteria being resistant to cephalosporins, so ESBL. In Sweden, it's between 1 and 5% now. Another bacteria that's very common is E. coli. This map doesn't look quite as bad, 
But you can see again, in Southern Europe, in Italy, you have a huge problem with ESBL in E. coli. Again, Sweden is looking pretty good. This is 2017. The scary thing here, and this is all orangish, so it's like 10 to 20% in the middle here, uh, Spain and up to Germany. The really scary thing is if you compare this picture with just 12 years ago, it looks like this. So this is 2005, and here you should be able to see everything is green except a couple of countries. So very rapidly, you went from this to this, which gives you an indication of how quickly this problem is spreading. In addition, so once you get to cephalosporins, there is now further generations of beta-lactams, specifically one called carbapenem, which again, you can see the square ring. This is a relatively new antibiotic used if you have an ESBL bacterial infection. And already, resistance is terrible in Southern Europe, in Italy and Greece in particular. Whereas, again, in Sweden, it is not so bad. So these infections could be resistant to everything. You will hear much more later when we get to politics and things like that. Um, I think, and some next week. So that is reality, unfortunately. Okay, so the first way I said the antibiotic resistance could work is by producing an enzyme that destroyed the antibiotic. The second way is something called target modification. Most antibiotics and most chemicals interact with the cell by interacting with proteins that fit together like a lock and key. So in this example, you have an antibiotic in blue, and it binds to its target in a very specific way. One way the cell can become resistant to the antibiotic is by changing the target. So... Instead of having a shape, this is a very simplified thing, but changing the shape so that it no longer binds the antibiotic properly. Uh, an example of this are mutations in the ribosome that make the cell resistant to the antibiotic streptomycin. And I'll show you another example in a moment. Another drug I haven't mentioned yet is called vancomycin. And it uses this kind of mechanism. So vancomycin is this very complex molecule. Uh, it's used to treat MRSA or MRSA, which is Staphylococcus aureus that is resistant already to methicillin, the most common uh, antibiotic that would be used for Staph aureus. So these are a big problem. Vancomycin is what is used to treat them. Vancomycin resistance is now seen and growing, and I'm going to explain how it occurs. Now, I showed this last week when I was talking about ampicillin or penicillin. So you have the cell wall, the peptidoglycan, where you have these two peptides that have to be cross-linked together by an enzyme called penicillin binding protein. Penicillins work by binding the, the uh, enzyme and preventing it from binding, right? Vancomycin actually works differently here, but still on the cell wall. Here you have the two peptides that should be linked together. Vancomycin binds to the peptides themselves. And therefore, the enzyme that needs to do that cross-linking isn't able to bind there anymore. So with time, the cell gets big holes in the peptidyl glycan and they burst. Now vancomycin resistance is very clever. If you look here, here's the peptide, and at the end is a little red ball. The red is alanine. In a vancomycin resistant cell, Instead of putting an alanine in that position, it puts a different subunit 
which is lactate. So now it's purple there. What that means is it's changed the target. And now vancomycin can kind of bind, but not very well. And so the, uh, the cell wall crosslinking enzyme can fit in there and do its job and make the crosslink. So now this cell is vancomycin resistant by changing the target. So that's the second big way resistance can occur. The third way is something called an efflux pump. So here in gray is the membrane. And in gram negatives, you also have the outer membrane up here. These are proteins that form a channel through the membrane and work as pumps to pump the antibiotic out of the cell. What happens, therefore, is it's as if you have a pump in a boat or something and you're taking on water, you just pump out the water or you pump out the antibiotic and there never gets to be enough antibiotic in the cell to cause a problem or enough water in the boat. The terrible thing about efflux pumps is they often recognize more than one antibiotic. So this family of efflux pumps pump out both amyoglycosides and fluoroquinolones. Amyoglycosides are ones that target the ribosome. And the R&D family does multiple drugs and pumps them out of the cell. So these are problematic because if you get one of these, you're resistant to many things all at once. The last mechanism is called resistance bypass. So you remember I told you about this tetrahydrofolic acid pathway in metabolism, where you have two drugs that inhibit the pathway. Bacteria can mutate so that they make this compound, tetrahydrofolate, through a different pathway. They either produce it through a completely different pathway, or they increase the amount of the precursor up here, PABA, so that it forces the reaction to go through. So it doesn't really change the target, it just doesn't care anymore. All right, so those are the four basic ways. Uh, there's one other type of resistance I want to mention, which is called natural resistance, or I'm calling natural resistance. Some bacteria simply are naturally resistant to an antibiotic. For example, gram-negative bacteria are resistant to drugs that target gram-positives and vice versa. But in addition, some states of bacteria can make them more resistant. For example, non-growing cells are more resistant to penicillin simply because they're not growing, so they don't need new peptidoglycan. So they tend to survive quite well. In addition, there's something called biofilm, and these can be much more resistant. So what's a biofilm? Biofilms are growth of cells on surfaces. So most bacteria like to grow on communities on surfaces. This is an example of a Staph aureus biofilm taken from a catheter. So but you all know what this is without maybe knowing what it is. You brush your teeth in the morning, you're removing a biofilm. Uh, you pick up a rock in the river, that is usually covered by a biofilm. So they grow everywhere, and they like to grow on these surfaces. And how that happens is shown here. So the bacteria which are normally swimming around might bump into a nice surface. They start to grow on the surface. They attach specifically to the surface. They start to make polysaccharides and form little colonies on the surface. Over time, they get bigger and bigger, creating quite big, um, complex communities. And often, this isn't one type of bacteria, it's many types, which can form lots of structures that depend on the material and where they're located. If it's in a river where the water is going very fast, it will look different than if it's in a pond that isn't moving. 
Eventually, some of the bacteria might decide to leave uh, the biofilm and go and perhaps bump into a new surface. They do this, yeah, they do this for a couple of reasons. They, uh, for one, if, if you think in terms of human disease, if a bacteria like E. coli ends up in the bladder, it needs to hold on, and it will form a biofilm on the uh, wall of the bladder or in the lungs for certain kinds of infections. Uh, usually it means it's in a good location to get food and be able to grow. In addition, it's protected by the other bacteria. Now, Biofilms are usually very resistant to antibiotics, and it's a huge problem. Why do you think a bacterial cell in a biofilm would be more resistant to an antibiotic? Think about that for a minute. There are many reasons, not all understood, but they're in different metabolic states. For example, oxygen nutrients are limiting. They're protected by this extra cytoplasmic polysaccharide. And bacteria near the surface are difficult to reach. So for all those reasons, it's a problem. And this is a problem in many, both in medical fields and also in, for example, um, food production, when you're, where you're producing that biofilms will form on tubing and on machinery, anywhere where it's a nice place for a bacteria to grow. We've talked about three kinds uh, or four kinds of resistance. Now, how do they get this resistance? I mean, the biofilm is obvious, but the other types, how do, how do they get this? Well, primarily through, or one way is through mutation. So if you have a population of cells and there's some kind of variation in these cells, when I said that cells uh, divide and they become clones of each other, that's true. But every so often there's a mistake and there can be a little bit of, there can be some mutations. So there is some variety there. So if you have a population that has a certain amount of variety or genetic variation, and you add a selection, for example, an antibiotic. After the selection, the only guys that are left are the most resistant. Those resistant ones then can grow up and take over the population. So that's a simple idea of evolution and selection. So mutants can arise from, uh, the original mutants and the genetic variation can arise from damage to DNA or mistakes during DNA replication. I'm going to show you DNA one more time. Here is DNA again with the base pairs, of course, uh, where it is always supposed to match C with G and A with T. As I mentioned before, here's the DNA, here's the RNA. And then each of these codons, so AUG becomes methionine. If you make a change in any of these bases, you will change the protein, as shown here. If we look at, here is a simpler example where everything is CAT, 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 which should be his, 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 his histidine. If you change one of these bases to from an A to a C, all of a sudden when the ribosome makes this protein, you have his, 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 and they're proline. This could completely change the protein, and it could make it completely inactive. So mutations are in the DNA, but then they're usually expressed in proteins by changes to the protein. So this can happen during replication, but it can also happen by chemicals or UV damage. So ultraviolet light can attack DNA and form dimers in the wrong direction here between two Ts in this example. So thymine dimers. This is why UV damage is dangerous to bacteria and to people.
when the cell goes to replicate this, it's got this big mess here. And often it doesn't quite know what to do with it. So it will make mistakes in replicating this DNA. There are repair enzymes that try to fix it, but again, they can make mistakes as well. So that's how you get this variation, how you get mutations. So a single base change can cause resistance to some antibiotics. These mutations are rather rare as far as for DNA replication, on the order of 1 in 10 to the 7th or 1 in 10 to the 9th cells. But there are many, many cells. One of those little colonies has like 10 to 7 cells. So it's, when you have such big numbers, this small number isn't so small. Drug resistance can arise much faster. There's something called horizontal gene transfer which is when DNA is passed directly from one organism to another. And that DNA can carry resistance to one or several different antibiotics. The equivalent of this is when, uh, when you have a baby, you give them your DNA, not directly, but they get your DNA. This is the equivalent of me handing my DNA to Martin and him taking up that DNA. So, this is what horizontal gene transfer is. And this happens fairly commonly in bacteria, and there are three ways it can occur. The first way it can occur is something called transformation. And this, I'll give you a little historical perspective on this. This was an experiment done in 1928. And what they knew is they had two strains of Staphylococcus pneumoniae. One strain is called rough, and one strain is called smooth. The rough strain does not cause disease, it is non-virulent. If you inject it into a mouse, the mouse is fine. If you take a smooth strain, inject it into a mouse, it, the mouse dies. If you take that smooth strain and you heat it up and inject it into a mouse, the mouse is fine. So this is a heat-killed smooth strain. But the experiment he did was he took a rough strain, where the mouse is fine, and the heat-killed smooth strain, mixed it together. Both of these alone aren't fine, but if you mix them together and put it in a mouse, the mouse dies. And he called this transformation because he could see that the bacteria in this mouse were now smooth bacteria. So what is this magic happening here? It was shown that the transforming principle, the thing that is being transferred is DNA. And that was shown in 1944. And what is actually happening here is this. Here, you're back to my boring slides. So, uh, here is a cell, and here's a cell. Some cells can take up DNA, either as circles, which we call plasmids, or as linear DNA, just pieces of DNA, and incorporate them either as plasmids or integrate them into their own chromosome. They can be actively taken up by some types of bacteria, like the ones used in the experiment I just showed, or some bacteria do it by mistake. They essentially, they don't mean to do this, but it happens sometimes. Or in the lab, we can induce some bacteria to do this. The cells that take up the DNA, we call competent. So some bacteria like to do this, take up DNA. Can you think of why they might like to take up DNA? If you think about, if you think about what DNA is, well, it can be a source of food. They need DNA. They need nucleotides to make more DNA. So it's a nutrition for them. That's one reason. I, I should say also nobody for sure knows why, but this is certainly one of them. 
other people speculate that it might be used to repair DNA. If you have a uh, break in your DNA, by picking up DNA, you might be able to fix it. And the third way is what you just said, is that you can evolve new traits. So if you pick up a gene that is very useful in the future and it's selected for, that is something that's going to be kept, that you're going to evolve the ability to take up DNA as well as the new trait. Okay, that's the first way, transformation. Now I want to move into the second way. First, I want to talk a little more about plasmids. So again, plasmids are small circular DNA molecules. We call them autonomously replicating, meaning they don't have to go into the chromosome. So every time the cell divides, it gets plasmids, and it copies the plasmid also. Some plasmids are in many copies, some in only one. Plasmids are incredibly common. Most natural strains of uh, bacteria have plasmids. And they can carry the genes for antibiotic resistance. You might ask where these magic plasmids come from. Well, they evolve from other types of mobile elements. So there are um, genes such as, or uh, DNA that, for example, from bacterial viruses, and transposons, transposons are hopping genes, genes that can hop around, as well as bacterial genes. Now, I'm talking about plasmids so much because this is actually the major way in which antibiotic resistance spreads through a mechanism called conjugation. Conjugation occurs, it's incredibly common, and it can cause genes to spread to unrelated cells. So again, here's our myplasmid with the antibiotic resistance gene. Some plasmids are called conjugative. Conjugative plasmids have some extra features. They produce a pillus. I mentioned pili last week. A pillus that is this appendage off the cell that is used for conjugation. And this shows an actual picture of two cells where one of them is expressing this pillus and attaching to another cell. So you need the pillus and it attaches to another cell. So let's look at how this happens. Here is the cell that is resistant. We call it the donor. It's producing a pillus. It grabs hold of another cell, the recipient cell, and then the pillus is retracted and the two cells are brought very close together, as shown here. Then what happens is a pore, a small hole between the two cells is formed, and the plasmid makes enzymes that causes it to cut one strand of the DNA and bring it in to the recipient. Shortly after then, both cells have one strand of DNA, which is then copied and replicated, ending up with two plasmids or one plasmid in each cell. This cell now can go ahead and conjugate with other cells. So both cells now are resistant to antibiotics and both can transfer. This in our lab can take place in a couple of minutes. If you, all you have to do is put the cells together and you're done. It's incredibly fast. Uh, and this is the most uh, common way for resistance to spread. The last way in which DNA can be transferred horizontally is using something called bacteriophage. These are bacterial viruses. They only infect viruses or only infect bacteria. And here is a picture of what looks like, at least one of them. You've got DNA in a head on top, surrounded by a protein coat. This is a slice through and that's a 3D model. This region here forms what essentially is a syringe that it can use to inject the DNA into a bacteria. The tail fibers that are on the side here are used to recognize that it's a, the right kind of bacteria. They're very specific. 
So they bind to the bacteria. Bacteriophages are crazy common. Scientists estimate there are 10 to the 30th bacteria in the world, but they also estimate there are 10 times that number of phage or bacteriophage. And we have very little knowledge about the diversity of phage. So how this works is as follows. A bacteriophage finds a bacteria, it attaches to it, it then injects the DNA into the cell. That DNA is then going to be copied. You get lots of copies. You then are going to start to make new proteins from that DNA to make new phages. During this process, the host chromosome is often broken up into pieces, the DNA. And then finally, you've got new phages inside the cell, and proteins are made that cause the cell then to explode. And the phages can go out and infect another bacteria. A typical phage might produce 100 new phage in just 20 minutes. So this is extremely effective. All right, if you want to see what these look like in the lab, it's shown here. So on this plate, again, you have a layer of just bacteria growing here. It's all cloudy. What you can see are little holes, what look like little holes. And those tiny holes are where a phage was uh, infected and killed all the bacteria in that area. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this, there are two reasons. The first reason is that these can spread antibiotic resistance by a mechanism called transduction. Transduction works like this. If you have a cell and it infects, uh, or sorry, you have a phage and it infects a cell, and I've made it different color DNA. It's not really different colored. It's just for making it easy. The phage has blue DNA, the cell has red DNA. It infects, it produces new phage. Sometimes when the phage is being assembled in the cell, it makes a mistake and it will package a piece of chromosomal DNA. That piece of chromosomal DNA could include an antibiotic resistance gene. So that when this cell, sorry, when this red phage infects the cell, it isn't going to kill the cell because it doesn't have phage DNA, it has E. coli or bacterial DNA. And it can recombine in the chromosome and add those genes to the bacteria. So these can transfer antibiotic resistance. But I want to emphasize the most common way is conjugation. To end today, I'm going to talk about alternative approaches to antibiotic resistance. We're going to talk much more about this later, but there are two things that are connected to what I've been talking about tonight. So the first one is what you just said, the idea of phage therapy. The, I, why not just use phage to kill bacteria? That's their job, kind of. So this was tested around the time of the discovery of phage in the 1920s. Uh, they had that idea, but they got very inconsistent results. It worked sometimes, it didn't work sometimes. We now know that not every phage infects every bacteria. So they didn't know that at that time. So they thought the phage could kill every infection, but in fact, it's very specific. So it didn't work, and then antibiotics came around and said, ah, who cares? Um, except in certain places in the former Soviet Union, where it continued to be studied. And so there is a big center in Georgia, which has been saying phage therapy for the last, I don't know exactly, 70 years or so. But now... In the West, this idea is being revitalized. So there is a lot of talk about using phage to kill infections. And 
To date, there are still in clinical trials, so we don't know how effective it's going to be. But there are cases where it's being used on patients that have no other treatment. And what are the examples I'm going to show you now? So there was a patient who had a bacteria which had one of these efflux pumps that I mentioned before. This was a patient who had an infection in his chest around, he had had some heart surgery. And he had an infection that was completely resistant to everything, primarily because of this efflux pump. It was pumping out the antibiotics. So the researchers found a phage that could bind the efflux pump and infect the cell. All right, so what happens there? I'll show you. And this goes to what you were saying as well. So here is the original strain. It's got an efflux pump. So it's antibiotic resistant, but it's sensitive to the phage because the phage binds the efflux pump. If it mutates, which bacteria do, so they become sen so they no longer is sensitive to the phage, it means it loses the efflux pump. And now it's sensitive to antibiotic, but resistant to the phage. If it mutates again, it's going to go back to this situation. So what they were able to do is treat the patient with both phage and the antibiotic at the same time. And this worked. The patient recovered from the infection. Uh, so using both of these together might be a very effective way to do this. But this is all very new. This was published, I think, a year and a half ago or so. A second way you can think about efflux pumps in particular, I want to mention. Another approach people are taking is, so here's the efflux pump pumping out antibiotics. Instead of worrying about the resistance uh, in general, why not just find a, a molecule that could block the efflux pump? And there have been cases of uh, finding inhibitors still early, early, early clinical testing that actually just bind the efflux pump, which prevents the antibiotic from being pumped out. That's another type of approach that's being taken. So to summarize what I've talked about in this last section, we've been talking about the spread of resistant bacteria. And you can look at this slide when you get home. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about another aspect of this, which has to do with the environment, the environment and use in livestock. Uh, because antibiotic resistance doesn't just happen in people, it happens in the environment as well. So we're going to talk about that next week. And then lastly, is so I mentioned, if you really want to learn about microbiology news, there is a Facebook and Twitter account that I run that you can follow if you like.